Horse Plus gave out a grant for gilding procedures in Costa Rica, and we've been chosen to travel there to show you guys the global impact the grant program is making. at the Universidad Nacional, which is the National University centered here in San Jose, actually Heredia. Uh, this is the veterinary campus for uh, UNA. All of our equipment gets stored here. We've got about a six hour drive today down to the um, La Casona region, an indigenous region in the south of the country. I am Neil Gray. I um, am a veterinarian. I had an equine practice in the Los Angeles, California area for 35 years. Stepped away from practice a couple of years ago. Started being involved with uh, the Equitarian Initiative about 10 years ago now. So the Equitarian Initiative is a 501c3 corporation, charitable organization, dedicated to working horse welfare, as well as educating veterinary students, as well as animal health workers and, and uh, others who help take care of those working horses. In the last few years, the Equitarian Initiative has really expanded our educational programming. Our focus tends to be more on areas where the students in the countries that we're working oftentimes are not getting much of an education about horses. Their veterinary curricula, oftentimes those are governmental schools and they don't include horses in their curriculum because horses are not considered production animals. So many of the governmental schools only focus on animals that are considered farm animals. And even though most of the animal production that occurs in those countries involves working horses, oftentimes those horses are left behind in terms of medical care and in terms of knowledge of the veterinarian, if there are even veterinarians in those areas. We've been working to try to help close that gap. So we've got multiple programs in countries uh, Peru, Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, here in Costa Rica currently. The Horse Plus Gelding Grant have uh, enabled us to provide more care. These trips are not inexpensive. The equipment, the, the, the medications, the supplies, we rely on donations in order to be able to do this work, to know that Horse Plus is able to help contribute what they can to, to this process, allows us to do more of these types of projects uh, than we otherwise would be able to do and to help more animals and more communities. And then also the horses in these communities are working horses and the connection to these more rural communities and also the indigenous communities that we can create with these students on these projects becomes a, a really nice piece for us to continue promoting the welfare of these horses in these more rural communities. We've made it here to the La Casona region. Mm -hmm. We're closer now to the Panama border and um, we're staying here at a farmhouse where we'll basically camp on the veranda of the farmhouse. This afternoon, we'll kind of go and organize everything and get ready for our first work day tomorrow. We'll start bright and early and hopefully have a, a day full of good work tomorrow. We're here this morning. Uh, it's our first work morning. We're at a site called La Pita. It's part of this indigenous region. There's multiple little communities within the indigenous region. Our group today consists of a crew, which is Costa Rican Equine Welfare. They're our main coordinator for this trip, um, take care of a lot of the logistics. They've done work here in these communities for uh, even going back before we started coming. I've got one other American veterinarian with me, and then we've also got eight uh, veterinary students from the Costa Rican University, uh, Universidad Nacional. And then we've got five um, zootechnica students from one of the other schools here in Costa Rica, which is basically like an animal science program. We're gonna get our gear unpacked and set up our stations. So the horse comes to the work site, crew does the registration, 
of the animal. Each horse gets an, an individual number for the day so that we can make sure that their medical record tracks with them through the different stations that we set up. So that intake area is responsible for that information on each animal. They also get a weight and a height on the animals as part of the information that they want to collect. The horse then moves to, to what we call our intake station where we'll do a physical exam on the animal. And if there's no other services required, then the animal will get vaccinated and dewormed at that time. And if that's all that, that needs to be done, then that animal's finished with that station. But we also have surgery station, dentistry station, a farrier station. The animal will proceed through those different stations depending on what they are here for. We're getting ready for our first castration. And this is a seven-year-old stallion. We're just getting organized and, and getting ready to anesthetize the first horse. One of the things that we worry about here are how far do they have to walk to get home and whether they have to cross any rivers to get home. Um, we don't want the horse swimming, um, that's dangerous, and we don't want the incision bathed in river water. We make sure we talk to the owner before surgery, uh, and we tell them that if they're having to cross any river where the water is higher than the horse's knees, that, that we don't want to castrate it here today. If they cannot get it home without crossing a river like that, we can try to find somebody here in the community that'll, that, that is willing to keep the horse locally for, for a few days before it's safe to, for the horse to travel through that river. Eso es solo para calmarlo un poco. Thank you. Gracias. My job today is the head of anesthesia. So we're going to be examining the horses when they come down from intake, listening to their hearts and lungs, assessing their weight, calculating drug doses, giving a pre-med with some xylazine, which is a sedative, to calm them down a little bit so that we can get in an IV catheter so that we have venous access throughout the procedure. And then when surgery team is ready, we'll go ahead and top up the xylazine, make sure they're well and sedated. And once they're well and sedated standing, we'll go ahead and anesthetize them. And once they're down, we'll position them correctly for the procedure that they're having. This one's castration. And then anesthesia team will be in charge of monitoring heart rate, respiratory rate, eye movements, body movements, give additional drugs as needed to keep the patient fully anesthetized and well monitored until the procedure is completed. And then we'll go ahead and hand recover each patient to the best of our ability and the environment provided. My name is Andrea Satella. I live in the Hudson Valley of New York and I am an equine veterinarian. At home, I primarily practice sport horse medicine, lameness, dentistry, and chiropractic. My father was born here and moved to the States when he was 18. Um, and we had come as a family many times and I had always wanted to participate in an equitarian initiative trip. And last year, the opportunity became available and the trip was to Costa Rica to the Osa Peninsula. So that was my first trip uh, with EI and this has been my second trip. You know, population control in a situation such as this where horses are roaming free, you know, horses aren't even being kept in their own herds. They're probably mixing herds with other horses. I think castrating these horses is extremely important, not only from a behavioral standpoint, but obviously from a population control standpoint. Um, from what I'm told, because obviously this is only my second year uh, involved in something like this, it's been something that they've seen over time, the owners more and more willing to do, because before the mentality was that it wasn't appropriate to take a horse's manhood, so to speak. So you can tell the education that crew and EI has put into these communities and how they have really taken that with value and shown up specifically for castration. They're not being talked into it. These programs give me a chance to utilize what knowledge I have from my career that was very good to me, um, a profession that's been very good to me and, and with horses that have uh, given me so much. Um, and it's a chance to give back to all of that, my profession as well as to the horse world in general and to horses. It's also a chance to work with these students, uh, try to help pass on some of that knowledge, give them an opportunity to learn. I you know, get so much out of these trips. Um, it really feeds my soul. The castration went fine. He was a little difficult for anesthesia. He wasn't terrible, um, but uh, he required a little bit of extra medication um, for the anesthesia and so his recovery was a little bit rougher than we would like but he stood up great and he's nice and strong that's my biggest fear is when they try to stand up and they're still very sedated if the um, actual anesthetic not so much the sedation but if the anesthetic hasn't completely worn off they don't really know which direction is up <laughs> and so they're if they're really dizzy then they can like somersault and hurt themselves so it's really important to make sure you're controlling what you can 
when they're recovering so that you try to keep them from hurting themselves or somebody else. He went into a castration surgery, then he went into the dental station. He has some really, really big sharp edges on the, mostly on the cheek side. My name is Dr. Adolfo Seño. I'm a veterinarian here in Costa Rica. I mainly focus on equine dentistry. That's pretty much my practice. De este lado si está con algún, si está mordiendo bien, pero si está levemente trabado, de este lado si está más, más libre. I work all around Costa Rica. Uh, wherever they call, they call me, I will go. So I travel all around the country. And that horse uses a bit, so he also had some bruises and, and issues on his bars because of that uh, being so tough on the bit. And he was cutting because of that, some hooks in the back. We balanced him out, we correct the angles, we took off the, the sharp edges and everything so he can be more comfortable and he can be a better horse. Crew, they needed a, a veterinarian to be part of it and uh, because they're bringing other veterinarians to do procedures because the laws in Costa Rica, they have to be a licensed veterinarian. I'm the one filling up the uh, paperwork and my name is under there. So I have to be uh, part of the team to make sure everything goes into, into legislation and uh, I'm the licensed vet in charge of pretty much everything. Right now what we're seeing is a, uh, it's an old mare. She's uh, 20 old or plus year old. Uh, well, she has some sharp points that we're taking out. It's lacerating a little bit, the soft tissue, the cheek side. And uh, she also, because of age, uh, their teeth are wearing out mostly. So we have to try to manage and work with what she has. She's not well balanced. She's off, uh, some of the teeth are off angle. So what I'm gonna try to do is put back at their angle so she can actually chew better and uh, get a little bit more weight. But uh, well, she has old teeth practically and uh, that's what we have to try and, and, and manage with and work with. I love sharing my knowledge. Uh, I like what I do, I do love my job. Teaching the students, it's, it's fun to make them uh, realize in real life because the, in vet school, what they have about equine dentistry is just so poor and coming into here and into the field with a qualified professional, I think they get a more into depth of that and so they get a really more interest and in the importance of what the welfare of the horse is gonna be if we give them better uh, treatment and better dentistry in the, uh, for their horses. This red roam gelding, uh, he had a retained baby tooth uh, that was causing the, uh, the permanent tooth to shift towards the inside of the mouth, causing some diastema and foot packing uh, that it will cause in the future uh, gingivitis. What we recommend in those cases is to extract the baby tooth and uh, just wait for the tooth, the permanent tooth, to shift back into his position so he can have a better movement of the mandible and uh, to avoid losing two permanent teeth because of gingivitis, pretty much like. So we're given just a little bit of xylazine, like the last horse as a pre-med, flushing that xylazine in through our catheter and getting ready to induce anesthesia for another castration. The most important thing I want the students to learn is, is what I call the dance or the, the sixth sense of anesthesia. You know, obviously as students, they're prepared with the mig per kig dosing of the drugs. They know the strength of the drugs. They know the way the drugs are supposed to be administered, what the action of each drug is. And that's wonderful and they need to know that. But then to apply that in a field setting and, and to know the feel of a horse's anesthetic plane and recovery without any monitoring equipment other than a stethoscope and their eyes and their hands. And I think that that's really what I wanted to impart on them. So, voy a empezar mi timer de cinco minutos. Yo llevo con lo que llevo de anestesia. Sí, yo puse la anestesia inicial en el papel. A las diez y treinta y siete. ¿Y qué lo puse? Yo puse diez y treinta y siete. Okay. This time around was to really get that feel for the anesthesia, the feel for, yes, they know the horse's weight, they've used a weight tape, but getting an idea of what they think the horse weighs. Yes, they know the calculated dose, but is it a horse that could probably use a little less or a little bit more? 
and they all did such a great job of feeling that out and learning. It, it was, it's very amazing. Castration number three, my friend. Same procedure as the last, xylazine, ketamine diazepam. Day's going well so far. We're moving along through the list of castrations. Everything so far so good. Nothing really abnormal. I just checked one of the castrations that was on our list and he is an abdominal cryptorchid as far as I can tell. I, he would let me, he was very good about letting me palpate him, but I couldn't find any hint of a testicle. Um, and he was letting me get way up into his canal with still no sign of, of any testicular tissue. So I think he's an abdominal crypt and we're not set up to do abdominal surgery here. So we're not gonna try to go after that, but uh, we have a, another cryptorchid that uh, is, was the horse after that, that I can feel the tail of the epididymis and we're gonna go after his. I, I don't think we'll have any trouble getting that one done. So we're gonna do a castration of this horse, this is stallion. Uh, he, we think his, his testicles are inguinal, so it's a little bit different castration, but we, we're gonna palpate them and we're gonna decide it. I think we're gonna do it. We're gonna just see first. Let me see if you're in the canal. Let me see. If, let me put my fingers on it, and I'll see, and then you can find it with my fingers. Right up. Okay, right here. Okay, gentle, gentle. Suave. Masa, poquito más arriba. Poquito más arriba. Yeah, and then just be really gentle. You don't want to push really hard. Just gentle and push up higher, but push against the leg. But I don't feel the testicle. But you feel something in the canal? Yes. There's something in that canal, right? Yes, but the, I don't know. You don't know what it is, but you can feel that there is, that it's not an empty canal. No, it's not an empty canal. Right, so I think I can grab that, and that's going to be the testicle. Okay. <laughs> I think so. My name is Isabel Céspedes. I'm a university student. I'm a vet student. And my, my work here is to learn and help the communities. I go to school in National University here in Costa Rica. I'm in my last year of university. In this castration, I, my job is assist the Dr. Neil because it's a different procedure. So I have to learn from Dr. Neil. So my job is assistant. So this horse is a little bit more challenging because of that small right testicle, but we can feel it now, especially that he's under anesthesia. And I think we're gonna be fine. So what I'm gonna do is dissect Okay. I've been helping the doctors, assistant, and learn from them all the procedures. I help with the castrations, I help with dentistry, and intake, we take parameters, we check up general health of the horses. So that's what I do, helping the doctors, learning and explaining to the people how we can help the, the horses. Do you have the mystery? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna cut this little piece off here just because I don't want it to leave, to leave it there. So this horse just got finished being castrated. This was the one that had the abnormal uh, right testicle that was very small. It was there and it was actually external to the um, inguinal ring. After the castration, we put some SWAT fly ointment around the area just to help keep flies away. And then on the incision, we use an aluminum spray. It acts as like a liquid bandage. The horse receives a dose of, of flunixin, which is an anti-inflammatory. And the an anesthesia is done with ketamine, which is a, actually a very good painkiller. So I, one of the effects of the anesthesia is also analgesia. Um, and the effect of the ketamine lasts longer than the, anest than the anesthetic effect of it. The analgesic effect um, actually lasts longer. So um, we probably get actually up to 24 hours of some pain killing effect from the type of anesthesia that we're using. But we do use a dose of banamine or flunixin um, is the generic name for it. And the horse does receive a dose of that. And they also are receiving two doses to give by mouth um, tomorrow and the day after. Uh, which are uh, usually those first few days are when you're going to get the most inflammation. So it looks like we're uh, about ready to start on the last castration of the day. Everything is getting prepped for him and uh, we'll get him done and, and call it a day for the surgery department. Well, this is my, my last horse I have for today. Of course, he has some sharp edges, uh, some ramps. His lateral movement was a little bit blocked and um, but yeah, it was pretty straightforward, pretty standard horse uh, we can have find. It was a young horse, so it was not a big deal to, to find anything too big. It was a pretty long day. We did a 
15 or 20 dentals and uh, different different cases, mainly all the lacerations. It's the most problem because of the sharp points. Horses are dropping feet because they are in pain while they're eating or they have a locked mandible. They can, can't move their jaw properly. So we help them with that. Uh, we saw some old horses, 20 something plus. Uh, they have pretty much wear down their all their teeth out to the gum line. So they're gonna have a, a hard time, but we help them make them a little bit more comfortable in the mouth so they can actually eat a little bit better. We'll see how it goes tomorrow. We're reaching the end of our work day. We're still gonna sit down later with the students and go over how the work day went. We'll do some case evaluations and case presentations with them, but we're done with our field work for the day. Um, we ended up castrating seven horses. Uh, there was one horse, the abdominal crypt, that we didn't do, unfortunately, but um, otherwise the surgeries went great. I think we saw around 57 or 58 horses total today. Um, all, everybody got vaccinated and dewormed. We've got another community when we're gonna start working in tomorrow at nine, which is about a two hour drive away. And we'll uh, head down to the next community and start working again tomorrow. We're here, uh, made it without any incidents down to Coape Agrapal, the palm oil plantation where we'll be working today. It should be a good day full of work. We've got the first surgery getting ready is going to be a horse that has a tumor growing on the edge of its eye and invading its cornea, uh, probably a squamous cell carcinoma. They did have a veterinarian that had been able to try to reduce the tumor a couple of times, but it keeps growing back. So this morning we're gonna go ahead and uh, take that horse's eye because otherwise that tumor is going to keep spreading and, and uh, likely end up being a reason for that horse's demise. Today we're at a community that it's called Copiagropal. We're going to work with some of the mules that help with howling the fruit of the palm for fruit of the palm oil. And this is going to be a day where we're working, just doing intake of these animals, measuring them, uh, their weight, their height, just making sure that there's no injuries in their body, um, checking out their body score condition. Uh, we ask the owners about their nutrition, how, what they give the animals, what they feed them, how long are their working hours, how many days a week they work, and basically what their husbandry uh, practices are with the animals. My name is Lisa Ortuno and I am the Executive Director for CREW, Costa Rica Equine Welfare. Right now we are doing our weekly community visits in the south part of the country. Over here we visit several indigenous communities and then other working equid communities. The focal point is to be able to examine the horses, examine their welfare, and see if they have injuries, what their hoof condition is, if they have any parasites, any uh, mistreatments from the human equit relationship, and to make sure they have the proper nutrition and the proper body score condition. There goes our two first patients. After we do this basic intake about welfare status and condition and what they do with their animals, then they go, they go to the veterinarian stations to do whatever they have to. For this first two horses, one is getting a castration, second one an inoculation. And uh, after that, they already had their hooves trimmed and they're gonna get their deworming and vaccinations uh, and just make sure that they're ready to go back home. These are ticks, so we have a lot of ticks around in the area as normal and because we're in the tropics they get worse and worse so we try to give the deworming so that they fall off and so that we could improve their health. For this week it's important for us to also 
not just come and check on the horse's welfare, but also since we have an, a strategic alliance with Equitarian Initiative, they come over and assist in all the health care issues of those horses. So as we do the inspection and get the routine of what recommendations we need to give the community and what we need to work with them in training and to make sure that the conditions are better for the animals, Equitarian always comes and helps with the health. It's not really distorting the lateral canthus too much. So the tumor itself doesn't look like it's distorting the side of the eye too much, but it, you can see it's pretty uncomfortable and, and he's blinking a lot and irritated and the flies are all over it. It's, it's going to be much better off without this eye. Um, I don't think he's seeing much out of that eye. There's probably a little bit of vision left in it or at least a cloudy vision left in it from the quick look that I got at it. He's tired of people messing with his eye, so once he's sedated, we'll get a little closer look and I can palpate the, the little deeper, yeah. but I'm not gonna poke at him right now since he's, we're just gonna make him more angry. So once he's sedated a little more, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that our surgical plan is the way we wanna proceed and then, uh, and then we'll start working on him. That's the eye. Um, what we do is we make an incision just behind the eyelids on both sides, an elliptical incision, just basically, so like you were going to cut off the eyelids, but only, only through the skin, not the entire thing. And then we're gonna dissect underneath our incision it, all the way around the eye, using, using like a blunt dissection to go around until, and, until we can completely remove everything together. Yeah, exactly. I told them to stop me if they're, if they're having any questions. What I like to do is I use a towel clamp to, to hold the eyelids and then I can use that as my handle and I want to dissect the bulbar, I want to leave the bulbar conjunctiva intact. So I'm taking everything including the bulbar conjunctiva. We're not going to do a, uh, put a, anything in and we're not taking just the eyeball. We're going to take all of the especially surrounding tissue <laughs> because of the tumor, especially because it's a tumor. And generally speaking, in horses, that's mostly what we do anyway. El sueño cell carcinoma tiene tejido, tiene, tiene raíces feas. Sí, es, sí. No sacan solo el glóbulo, sino también saca todo. The optic nerve also has the vessels. We're going to put, once we have this free, we're going to put a clamp on that optic nerve and then we'll put a suture, we'll, we'll, we'll do a circumferential suture around the optic nerve to con for also for the vasculature. And that's our, this, and then once we're done with that, I'll pro I, I usually don't even have anything else I try to suture except the lids. Bueno, perfecto. Bueno, bueno. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some eye ointments in the pharmacy box if you want to give them any eye ointment. But. Once we're settled, I'll go get it. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead with my retro bulbar and then we'll clean. So let's start scrubbing that. So Funixin, vamos a hacer nueve. Okay, uh, the scalpel is what I'm going to need first, the is three. So my incision is just along the eyelid margin and then the same for my upper eyelid. It's been a process to start working with the communities. It's always difficult to come in and to try to tell how to make things better. It's not going to work as easy as we think. So the best thing that we always do is find leaders here in the community and people that are more aware and that know that they need to change some of their habits with the animals and their husbandry practices. And so once we do that, we start with our education part and then with the brigades and the veterinarian brigades. And I think it has been working very well. It's a, as I say, it's a process. It doesn't happen from one day to another. It takes time to get their uh, trust and confidence and for them to come and give us their horses or their mules or their donkeys in our hands and let us do what we need to do. It's always an education process. So we need to m make sure that they're well aware of the needs, of the importance, and to understand that we wanna help. It's not that we wanna critique or make things worse, it's that we wanna hand by hand with them, help them with their animals' welfare so that they could all benefit from it.
Futura, por favor. Gracias. So we're here with Chaco, who we uh, had to take his eye out because of the tumor that's been growing there. Um, Chaco did really well with surgery. He's up and he's going to be a whole lot more comfortable without that tumor in his eye. And we took as much tissue as we could. Um, felt that we got pretty good margins from what we could tell. Hopefully there's not any uh, tumor left behind. There's no great way for us to tell here whether we're completely successful in getting rid of his tumor or if, because there certainly exists the possibility that that may come back. Um, but hopefully we've gotten rid of it for him. And the stitches that are in there are going to dissolve on their own, um, so nobody has to take those out. And uh, hopefully Chaco just gets to live the rest of his life without tumors and uh, get a get a nice pain-free situation out of the deal. ¿Cuántos años tiene? Él tiene dos años y un par de meses. ¿Y usted tenerlo más o menos? Cuatro meses. ¿Y qué tan largo queda de aquí? Eh, 20 minutos, 25. ¿Y venía a pie o venía, no, venía en, en camión? En pero... camión. Uh -huh. Y yo le voy a decir cero, yo le iba a llevar mañana a Santa Rosa, no sé okay. si, ajá. Ajá. pero el problema es que tenía que dejarlo allá y no me estaba gustando mucho. Hi, I'm Gretel Solano Mora, I'm an animal science engineer. My main job in crew is work as an assistant to the director, working on reports, taking data, analyzing the welfare data that we uh, take in our field trips. Also, I work in the investigation uh, department of crew where where I work with the students and other professionals to generate investigations all around uh, equid welfare. He actually had a very good con body condition score and the hooves were good and he has a little of the issues I can see with this exam is a little bit of ticks but nothing to worry about today he will be um, the worm and everything that should take off the thick, so, so it, it is good, it's very good. Entonces, acá lo que se hace es, en mi caso yo me pongo los guantes para no contaminar a los posibles otros animales que tengamos que atender, a pesar de que estamos haciendo un bien, vamos a hacer un mal. It's very important uh, that the students know the importance of the relationship between the animal science engineers and the vets so we can work as a team <laughs> so that's the main uh, thing i try to encourage with the vet students to have this relationship with between careers and i think that's the most important part of my job when teaching to the vet students the white one she is a very nice horse she has a very good condition score but the owner told us she almost doesn't work uh, so the condition of of those horses tend to be better. The condition of this mare is very good. Eso es, muy bien. Okay, haga el otro lado, haga el otro lado, de una vez. My name is Mitzi. Uh, I study uh, veterinary medicine in the universe, National University in Costa Rica. Uh, ha sido muy bueno, es mi primera vez y nunca había hecho nada acerca de dientes. El doctor Cedeño tiene mucha paciencia y me ha enseñado acerca de todo, cuál es exactamente cada diente, las arcadas, la maxila, la mandíbula y cuáles serían los problemas que podrían estar ocasionando que, que haya algún problema en el animal como de desnutrición o a, algo similar. Entonces hoy hemos tenido tres casos, este, hemos hecho extracciones, hicimos dos extracciones de dientes de lobo, sus dientes quedaron muy buenos de verdad, lo cual va a mejorar su alimentación y va a hacer que el caballo se pueda alimentar de una mejor manera. One of the other vets noticed there was a, there were some wolf teeth, some tiny little little vestigios uh, teeth. Uh, normally they affect with the vet, so we recommend to extract them. And uh, while we are opening the, his mouth and doing a, a, a thorough exam, we found out there were some baby teeth uh, loose uh, in the front teeth, their incisors. So we pulled them out uh, so the, uh, the permanent tooth can erupt normally. We took up some points. He had some big hook causing a big laceration on the far back of the mouth. Uh, we balanced everything and uh, now we finished with the horse and now it's really, really nice. Everything's going really well so far. We're getting through most of the castrations. We've got two to go. Um, the one horse behind me was the last one we did. He just stood up really nicely. We've got the, a mule uh, that direction behind me. 
is gonna be our next castration. Mules are a little bit different. They require a little bit different dosing on the anesthesia regimen because they uh, metabolize those drugs a little bit more rapidly. Um, and so you have to give a little bit higher dose. Then we've got one horse left after that uh, to castrate today. I know that the other stations look like they're uh, wrapping up for the day a little bit as well. And I think everything's going well so far. Being able to assist these communities that rely on these animals um, so deeply for their livelihoods, um, for their day-to-day -day lives in a way that the horses, certainly in my practice in Los Angeles, California, that was not the role of horses. And for me to be able to help these communities take better care of their horses gives them uh, better horses that c help care for them. So we're finishing up our day. They're packing our supplies in. We only have about a 10 minute drive down the road to where we're staying tonight, which is really nice because we're all getting pretty tired. Um, the day went great. We, we, we didn't have a, a lot of patience today. Today was actually not supposed to be one of our working days, but we had to readjust our schedule a little bit. This worked out really well because it gave us a chance to really spend t time on each horse with the students to allow the students to be more direct hands-on on some of the surgeries and, and uh, uh, some, some of the surgeries that were a little bit more difficult. So that was great. I think the students got a lot out of it, had a great day. We're gonna actually be back at this spot on Friday morning to finish up with some other horses in the community. Tomorrow, uh, we'll drive about 45 minutes or, or an hour from here to a community called Santa Rosa, another indigenous community. And usually that, that site, we've got a lot of horses, probably anywhere from 60 to 100 horses tomorrow. So uh, we're gonna clean up and rest up and be ready for another day tomorrow. Today we are going to work in a community named Santa Rosa. It's part uh, indigenous community and part non-indigenous community. It's gonna be a really rough day. We're gonna get um, more than 50 horses and some mules also. It's a, a mule community. They also do the cropping of the fruit of the palm oil. And then they usually use their horses for regular human transportation or crop. Uh, transportation around the area. Hola, chiquita. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Mm? ¿Mm? Yeah. Hola. My name is Diana Arguello and I am a veterinarian. I was born here in Costa Rica, but my family is also Nicaraguan, so I actually studied my profession, I went to vet school in Nicaragua. Ever since I was in vet school, I was able to volunteer with NGOs like Equitarian Initiative. And there, um, that's where I, I knew immediately that my passion was horses and that I like to work with working equids. We're working on the, for the intake part of the, of the project where we take the horses and we do their physical examination and um, we apply their vaccines, their dewormer and their meds for their flea and tick medication. Six years ago, I came back to Costa Rica and I, I started volunteering with Equitarian Initiative, um, first in the Costa Rica, um, one of the Costa Rica projects. And two years ago, I started coming to this one too and helping them with this project too. I also volunteer with the Peru project and with the Nicaragua project. This part is very important because it's, it's what we call like the first line of, of knowledge or importance for the students where we focus 
first with any student that is just starting or it's in the in the lower years of the career. We would teach them first to just have like a general observation from the distance always, um, just to kind of figure out what, what's their attitude, if there is something very obvious that something's sticking out or a wound or just like an immense load of ticks like you can see in this one um, in the eyelid, right? That's all ticks or uh, tick um, eggs and also in the ears you can see them very in a big one. I always start thinking like okay if there's white skin and the face then I know that it's something I have to tell the owner and, and explain the owner about the importance of protecting the skin from the sun. So those kind of things I kind of look through. Obviously we've, I also most of the time figure out if it's male, female, right? Um, just obvious stuff that you can tell from the distance without really starting the process of making him anxious or um, stressed. My role in the Equitarian Initiative is it's mostly the education with the students and the owners. And I also help with uh, anesthesia. And I have like a role of like organizing and making sure that the flow is, is working with the students and the patients. And I really like it. I, I, I love going into communities and and just teaching what I know to the others and learning from the other vets that come to volunteer with EI. What she was giving in a topical way, it's the flea and like the tick medication in this case. And um, yeah, and her vaccine, which we need to put, will be, will be applying it IM in her neck. Con menos de eso, no hagas tanto para atrás. Realmente con solo que medio lo movas hacia atrás, ya aquí, si hay, si hay sangre, la vas a ver aquí, de un solo. This is something very important that we've, we've been doing owner education in other programs about it, because in these conditions where there's no vet around and, and they almost, all, almost just see us <laughs> during the year, they will need to put an injection from time to time. So we've been explaining to them where to, we've been explaining where so that at least we know that it will go on the right place, right? And we, and no big problems, like big abscesses or other worse things happen. We, if the ligament is here and the bone and nerve and, and blood, um, veins and arteries are here then you we have like a small triangle we have a triangle zone where there is only muscle and it's the best place for an injection the blood samples we're taking them just to do like basic lab work hematocrites just to count the blood cells see how her general nutrition might be doing we're also testing like the protein level that will tell us how well she's hydrated. And we will also be doing some DNA test. We'll see how this, this mom is doing. <laughs> the pregnant mare that we were doing the physical exam on, um, she is overall just in the physical exam. It looks like she's healthy. She had her vaccine, her dewormer, her tick med. And we also decided to send her to hooves, to the hoof station. Just, just in general, I like to send the pregnant mares to the hoof station because I feel like what better than a hoof work to make them a little more comfortable with all that extra weight. Working with the communities is very important because it's a way of, of giving back everything like that you know and also with the students in a lot of 
the universities in Latin America, or at least in Central America, it's very hard to get practice or like, you go to the university, but it's very hard to go out to the field and actually um, practice what you're learning. So I love helping give this, like the students, the opportunity to learn as much as they can. I also love to see how the, how it changes everyone, it just changes everything, like the perception of the world, the perception of, of your profession, it helps you know for sure, like remember why you started to do this in the first place, because back in, in like the usual day-to-day -day activities, sometimes you lose that sense of why, why it's so important or how much we love animals, which is why we started to do this. And in this type of work, you learn to also love and appreciate the people in the community, which is kind of hard for a vet student. They will also say, I love animals, I don't, but, but it then becomes like, I love animals and the community, like at the same time. In general, in these tropical countries, for some reason, they love having white horses with white skin <laughs> because they're pretty. Of course they're pretty, but their skin, they're, they're constantly under the sun and in these conditions. So they tend to always have sunburn in, um, in their skin. And we've seen several cases of squamous cell carcinoma. So I always like talking to the owners, explaining them that that's a possibility, that there is sunburn. And maybe there are ways not exactly to prevent it but we can still try right so i i was telling the owner that there's something as simple as the baby ointment that you put so that babies don't get burned like in their diapers then that is something that they can apply in the skin and it will help them not to get burned and also it has like a water resistant um, property so it won't get washed away as quick as if for example they could put just general sunblock but the sunblock they would have to reapply like a million times more so it's just ideas right it won't probably be excellent but it will help i also like telling them that a lot of that sun that sunburn is really really um painful like just like when we go to the beach and we like have extra time under the sun, like and we don't like to get touched or like ah ah right. So that happens to horses too. And sometimes they say that they their behavior is bad, but they have these robes in their head uh, rubbing them all through the sunburn. So I I you can't blame them, right? So I I try to like put that aspect in place that it might not be a, it's not a bad horse, it's just being, it's painful, right? This is a baby, he's only six months old, and he obviously is not like handled much, so he's not used to so many people and people grabbing him, right? So now that we, when they come like this, once we grab them, then we try to be as fast as possible and just do what we need to do so that he can just be free and, and, and not be like afraid. <laughs> so we, we took just like, we didn't do a whole physical exam. We took the basic vital signs and uh, we did the temperature. What she gave um, orally was the dewormer. It's a different dewormer than what would give uh, the, um, an adult. And uh, she gave also uh, a vaccine. And I'm sending him home with an extra dose of dewormer to give him the next like, six weeks. So we're here with this five-year-old mule that we're, we're gonna work on a sarcoid on the inside of her right thigh. A sarcoid is a virally induced tumor and she has a, a, about a three inch long tumor um, that it has a, a, an ulcerated portion to it, at, which means that it's open and bleeding a little bit, the flies are bothering it. So we're gonna try to take a piece of that tumor and process that a little bit 
and do what we call an autoimmunization. Um, so we're gonna use a piece of that tumor to try to induce an immune response in the body to try to see if this mule's able to get rid of that tumor herself. So we'll take a piece of that tumor off. We're gonna do a little treatment to that to sterilize it and to cut it up into little tiny pieces, crush it. And we'll put a little pocket with that material in her neck. We call that a marsupialization of the tumor. We'll um, see if we get a proper immune reaction from her that way that'll help her get rid of the tumor. That's our plan and uh, that's the, gonna be the next surgery. It's not very fragile tissue. So yeah. it's diff it behaves differently than like a um, granulation tissue. So I'm just making, I'm just gonna work on this to get little pieces. The formalin's gonna denature the proteins in it a little bit. The, um, and help, you know, it's not obviously not a sterile thing. I don't want to spread the tumor, and there is a risk, and we explained to the owner that there is a risk of spreading this by doing this. Um, even sometimes just by cutting a piece off like I just did, it'll aggravate the tumor and it just grows more. So it's always a little bit of a chance, but we think it's worth the chance for what we're doing. I'm also gonna put some topical medicine on the tumor um, to see if I can get a, an immune reaction that way. I don't think the owner's gonna be able to put medicine on that tumor every day. Otherwise, I would love to be doing that. There's a, I have some topical medicine that, that could help reduce it. But we're gonna just take this, we're gonna make a little incision in her skin and we're gonna put some pieces of this in there. We'll see if we can get her body's immune system triggered to produce a reaction and actually the other tumor should regress if that can occur. I'm just gonna take this and I may, may enlarge my pocket with these mosquitoes. That's what I was gonna use those for. Okay. Is to just take and put it in my pocket, stretch it out just a little bit. So I have a nice little subcutaneous tunnel. And then I'm gonna take my material that I was chopping up there and just put it in that little tunnel. Like that. Okay, put one little stitch in that and we're done. And that's all we gotta do, and we're done. But we're gonna put a little medicine on that sarcoid, because this medicine hopefully will also create a little immune reaction here too. That's the goal of it, and we'll see. I think everything went fine, and uh, the, the anesthesia went great. Um, it's a really, really fast procedure. So she's up and happy, and uh, we're done, and we'll see how, how uh, this works. It's important when when we want to send treatments sometimes um, it's hard because there's owners that you know are not going to follow instructions and some that will that will be so this was a great owner for the treatment too because he's very involved he has a good handling of his horses and um, i we do make sure that they know that with the exterior treatment the sarcoid will only get worse and very nasty and it will be like really like scary to see it before it starts to die and get better. So we make sure to tell the owner that and he was comfortable with it. So hopefully it's going to be a success. Bella Siete, Las Dos Siete de Arriba, Mae. Aquí, sí, aquí. exactamente, son unas ETRs. Ok, eso es todo, man. He has a couple of ramps, uh, some ETR, some steps. Uh, pretty much standard, what we mostly find in this type of horses that are eating in the in pasture. Uh, but it's pretty standard, but this horse is having some issues eating. So maybe he's in a little bit of a pain. So that's a little bit what we are trying to uh, avoid so he can eat better and get a, a better body condition score. One of the most important things that we teach is, well, how to identify the problems. Why are we making a difference in that, in that correction? Why we do that correction? That's the most important. They, they know the anatomy, they know the physiology, they know everything. But when they supplied, we need the, the, to show them why is it uh, causing a problem or not. Uh, we teach him also how to use the, 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 the power equipment and how to equilibrate the mouth better uh, or, or to get them more skills to create a, a better balanced mouth in the horse. 
So there's a horse that walked from a far distance. Um, we're suspecting that it's very anemic. Its mucous membranes are very white, delayed capillary refill time, has a systolic murmur, which is typical of a physiologic murmur uh, from anemia and dehydration. Uh, was thought at first to have diarrhea, although did pass some normal manure here. Um, covered in bat bites and the penis is full of screwworms. So has a long way to walk home. Obviously we don't want to vaccinate him. Um, we don't want to sedate him and we don't want to anesthetize him. So we're going to go ahead and attempt to do a pudendal nerve block uh, underneath his tail between his legs to see if we can get him to drop his penis without sedation and remove the screw worms. Uh, his bat bites have been scrubbed and cleaned. And we're also going to give him some IV fluids uh, to help him with his hydration status and his trip home. And we're going to forego vaccination and deworming. Uh, due to his health status at the moment. Hi, my name is Jose. I'm a vet student right now. This is my sixth time with Equitarian Initiative. I feel like every trip is different. You learn a lot from the community, the students that are able to be here and the, the doctors from the United States. So it's a good thing for, for us to learn from doctors from other countries and uh, also an excellent experience for you to practice as a student. Uh, they let you do a lot of things uh, that you don't get the chance to do with horses in the vet school. And it also is a good thing because you can talk to the owners and also see the realities in, in this kind of community. If you see more from the right side, probably mitral, more from the right side, probably tricuspid. Okay. Typically, the mm -hmm. murmurs of mm -hmm. physiologic murmur uh -huh. are the mitral, but we don't know if it's echo. echo. Mm -hmm. It is a mitral, it's 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 a mitral, and the owners really appreciate that you come here and help them because this community doesn't have access to a, a general attention from, for their horses. So it's, it has like a lot of elements that are important for, for us as, as students and for the communities also. He's using a pair of hemostats to remove all of the screw worms from the tip of the penis adjacent to the urethra. And, uh, there are probably at least a hundred of them. But there's another parasite that visually looks, grossly looks the same as this one, and it's reportable because it's eradicated in Costa Rica. So they took some separate samples to send to the state to make sure that it's not the reportable uh, type of parasite. The procedure went very well. Uh, five liters of IV fluids, and it perked him up. And we went ahead and performed the nerve block, removed the screw worms, and they are being, I got the name for you guys, they are being sent out to rule out what's called gusano barenador, which the scientific term for that is cochleomyia hominivorax, uh, which is a reportable disease in Costa Rica, which is thought to be eradicated. Uh, one of the local Costa Rican veterinarians who's with us feels that he thinks it might be that one visually, grossly. So we kept some aside to send out to the state lab. Our patient is over in dentistry now. The veterinary dentist feels he can take some points out of his mouth without having to sedate him. So that's wonderful. And then if he's doing well, maybe we can trim his feet. And he's got a five hour walk home. He did a five hour walk to get here today. Uh, so hopefully his owner will be able to find a place to rest on the way home. He said he has a couple friends on the way home from here where he might be able to keep the gelding overnight so that he doesn't have to walk another five hours. On these types of projects, it's not unusual at all for somebody to have walked three or four hours to come to one of our work sites. And that, to me, speaks volumes in terms of their desire to better care for their animals. It's not that these uh, people don't want to do a better job or provide care for their horses. They just simply may not have the resources to do that. And so when, when somebody tells me that they have a three hour walk home after we've uh, worked on their animal, it makes me understand the value of what we're doing because if they've given up an entire, entire day of their life to walk here that kind of distance and to be patient while we get through all the animals and then to, to walk three hours back home at the end of that day. Um, 
that that to me makes me want to give every bit that I can to help them. It was a good day. I think that part of it was that at the beginning people are like a little lost on how to do things, on how to organize, but I think that the logistics and the students uh, got the idea pretty fast. So I think that at this point of the day we work like very well because we know what we need to do and how to organize quickly and things like that. It's a good thing for, for us to be uh, a team and to communicate with each other. And I think that we need to, to go through like a messy moment and then we can organize and, and get things together, yeah. Okay, it is Friday morning and we are back at the Huape Agrapal palm oil plantation or processing plant and the student's bus has to head back to San Jose by contract. The bus has to be back at the school before dark. So we're going to have a, a, a bit of a shortened day with the students. We've asked the owners of the horses to come early so that we can try to get wrapped up early with the students and we won't have a lot of uh, trouble finishing up the horses because our equipment has to travel on that truck because we don't have enough space uh, in the rest of the vehicles to get all our equipment back. So it should be a bit of a shortened day today. And we do have at least one castration coming this morning. Um, hoping to see a bunch of other animals as well. So we'll see what shows up. Today is the last day of five that we've been on the road. So it feels good <laughs> to, to feel that we are close to the end. It's been a rough uh, set of days, but everything has worked perfectly. Yeah, we are a little bit tired. That's the truth. <laughs> but I think it has been a very productive couple of days. We have been seeing a lot of horses and that's the feeling accomplished that we can have about the good work we are doing. Honestly, I feel really tired, but really happy about the experience. Uh, I learned so much in this trip. I practice a lot. I'm really glad and happy about that. I'm helping Dr. Cedeño today in dentistry, and I hope I learn a lot more from him. It's hard to tell which part is, uh, it's my favorite, but I think meeting new people and uh, sharing and trying to help, talking to the community, trying to talk to them if they have any uh, questions, uh, answering the questions, but pretty much meeting new people and meeting new places, traveling around, that's kind of like my, my preference yeah. of this. Also, I think uh, helping those animals and try to come back the next year and see they have evolved or they have changes into the positive. I think that's one of the things that, I, uh, that I'm more proud of, that we are doing a better life for those animals, for those working animals. My favorite part is that I got the chance to do like another role because I was like in a student mode, but now I'm kind of an instructor. So it was very cool to be able to do that in this point of my life because I, when I came here, everything was like brand new and you don't know what to do. But right now I'm able to, to do it and to teach the students. And that's part of the, the mission and the purpose of Equitarian Initiative also. These projects, I think, are, are an opportunity to connect with the greater horse world and the other societies as a whole that are different from ours. We may be able to have some resources that they don't have. We're not better than they are. I'm not smarter than any of these students that I'm working with. They're, they're wonderful students. The horse owners themselves are, are, are wonderful people. They just don't have much access or the same access to care that the animals that live near me do. And being able to, to have uh, people see what we do, um, understand how this helps. So it's really important that our society that has so much and that our horse owners that have so much help take care of these animals. It's our responsibility to help those who don't have as much as we do and that don't have the kind of access to this care that we have. 
And if we can, can help them understand how to better care for their animals, those animals are gonna be much better off. So the castration went really well, no complications. The student did a great job. I, uh, he's done a couple in the past, so he only needed a little bit of uh, direction, um, but he did a great job and uh, everything went beautifully. We've got one more to do, um, and that'll probably be a, the only other castration that we do today. We're about to do a pregnancy check. We have a, an ultrasound, a butterfly ultrasound that is very practical in these cases. Uh, when we're in the field, we use alcohol in the area that we're going to check and we, we will find out what we can. Hola, soy el Dr. Maroto. Es, soy médico veterinario. Me dedico a la práctica de quinos eh, acá en Costa Rica, en la zona norte del país. Principalmente ayudo en medicina un poco deportiva, preventiva, un poco de reproducción, odontología. Eso es en lo que me desarrollo principalmente en mi práctica profesional. Cuando estaba estudiando, eh, por ahí del 2015-2016, vine de estudiante a trabajar por acá y comencé a ver la necesidad que había eh, en las zonas indígenas del país y, y zonas donde habían caballos de trabajo, ¿verdad? Había mucho problema, mucha problemática de cascos, de dientes. Ellos como son de bajos recursos, no tienen mucho dinero para poder pagar a profesionales. Entonces, gracias a este proyecto con, junto con Crew, este, se ha podido eh, mejorar muchas de esas condiciones. A lo que vamos es a que tengamos o, o esta gente de estas zonas rurales más preocupada por sus animales, o sea que hay un verdadero bienestar animal hacia, y respeto hacia los animales. O sea, a la gente no, no le importa mucho la salud de sus animales. Entonces, yo espero ver en un futuro más amor por ellos, principalmente. Uh, Mary wasn't pregnant, so we decided to check uh, the other organs in, in her body, like the stomach and the colon and things like that, but it was pretty normal, so... Let's get him en los cinco puntos correctos, ¿verdad? Antes de dar la anestesia, ¿ok? Now stretch him out. Yeah, let's just open it up a little bit. There you go. And choose a side and start. Diana's done castration before, but it's been a few years since she's done one, and she just wasn't as comfortable since it had been a while, and she hadn't, she has used the Equa Twister, but but uh, it's been a while for that as well, and she's only used it on a couple of occasions, so she just wanted to make sure um, that I was uh, holding her hand a little bit through the surgery. All EI projects have things in common that they also have its peculiarities or things that make them unique. And this project is very unique because it's, it's the first project uh, of EI that is also worked along with CREW, with Costa Rica Equine Welfare, and UNA University as well. So it's very nice because it's actually, it was actually one of the first projects to not be just about EI coming in, it's about EI coming and working alongside another nonprofit uh, that takes care of, of the horse's welfare. So I, I really like that part. It, it was very interesting for me to be part of this project and see how everything kind of just blends and and, and they work out. And also it, it has an extra element of having so techni students, which we don't have in any other project of EI. So it's, it's really nice just how just very different random things just come together. And, and I think we make a good work. <laughs> so we're just gonna clean everything up, Mitzi. Um, and uh, we're gonna put all the instruments away like we had them and uh, we're, we're done with surgery for today. Everything went great. Um, the horse was anesthetized nicely, no real problems at all with that. One testicle was a little bit smaller than the other. We actually changed techniques for that testicle. There's a way to do it with the Equa Twister, but it's a little bit more difficult. And since Diana's not as comfortable with the Equa Twister yet, it was just gonna be a little easier for her to use the emasculator on that testicle. We just went ahead and used that. It was better than what I expected. So. <laughs> no, it's nice to see things different in different ways, right? So I like that. I liked what we did. I think overall it's been a fantastic week. We had a phenomenal group of students. They were 
incredibly engaged. They were all hardworking, wanting to learn. They learned a lot. Um, they were open to learning. Uh, and and I, I really enjoyed everybody that we got to work with. Um, and and that's, that's what makes it a really great trip.